I'm going to start the lecture by reading something that Chuck Colson sent out a while back. Every once in a while I read something and it just catches my attention because the implications are, are huge and they're not necessarily immediately apparent. Uh, but this is a story, uh, it was written by uh, prison, prison Fellowship President Mark Early, um, and, and he says he has a friend named Julie that went away to college, and she made a point of sharing Christ with her roommates, as Christians should do. And they listened politely and seemed very supportive. Julie was excited because all of her roommates seemed very open to the gospel message. But to her surprise, they responded just as warmly, warmly when Sally said she was into the New Age and believed that God was within all of us. And then Amy said she believed that God was a force, the kind she had seen on Star Wars and other movies. And Ruth followed up by saying she was a very spiritual person but didn't believe there was any God at all. But most baffling at all to Julie was that the others agreed that everyone was really saying the same thing. Now see, that's where our culture is at. Totally opposite spiritual ideas, completely conflicting spiritual ideas, and yet these young people have been trained to believe that they're basically all the same thing. Now, Alan Bloom wrote a very, very famous and influential book clear back in 1987. It was called Closing of the American Mind, and this was one of the statements he made in the introduction to that book. There is one thing that a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering university believes or says that he believes that truth is relative. In other words, in our culture today, truth is considered very fluid. It's a philosophical concept. And if two people have completely opposite truths about things, then, well, that's good for them. As long as they believe something, that's all that matters. These same students would never have that viewpoint about gravity. They wouldn't believe that if I believe gravity doesn't exist and I believe it strong enough, then that's all that matters. You see, they have come to think there's a complete separation of the physical world and physical stuff and scientific stuff and religious philosophic stuff. They've seen it as a complete separation and that's the culture we live in and that's the people that you all are surrounded with because for the most part, if not everyone here, they believe in all or some part of Christian concepts of absolutes, but it is not what our culture believes. You see, there's a consequence to what's going on here as we separate the physical world from the spiritual world, and this is the consequence. Uh, this is a Barna poll. It's been done many times as late as the year 2000. He's, he has went out, done polls, fought, done studies, tracked what's going on in our churches, and found out that up to 70 or more percent of youth in evangelical, Bible-believing colleges, when they leave for secular college, within a year they consider their religious beliefs fluid or irrelevant. They no longer believe in what the Bible has to say. What in the world's going on? How could we get to that point as a culture? You see, America has more churches America is a country that has, it has more churches, it has more denominations, it has more Christian colleges, more seminaries, Christian radio, Christian bookstore, parachurch ministries, Dobson and Swindoll, and, and, and all these ministries, Larry Burkett. And yet, as we look over the last two decades, three decades, we see a nation that with every passing year is becoming less Christian, not more Christian. Now, God built me in a certain way. I've always loved to take things apart. I've loved to try to figure out how things work. As a kid, I would tear stuff apart and try to put it back together, usually unsuccessfully. And as I look at this, I, I see a church that it's, it's not like it's not doing what it ought to be doing. It's out there preaching about Jesus Christ. We, we had promise keepers, huge movement among men over the last 10 years ago. And yet, in, in the wake of promise keepers, do we see a nation that is more moving toward Christian principles or move more moving away from Christian principles. And most people, if they're really honest, would have to agree we're moving away. What's going on, the church is very busy doing what God put the church here on earth to do, which is to speak on spiritual matters, to speak on truth and reality, but they're not tying reality to the physical world for the most part. And the ground on which this 
gospel message is being spread is becoming more and more rocky and more thorny and more hard-packed, and people are less receptive. It's like the girls I talked about at the very beginning. They just throw that into, well, that's nice, you believe it, but I have my own reality. Why? The Bible, Jesus, starting with Jesus, really put his finger right on the bullseye of what is going on and why we're losing our culture and why the European nations are essentially pagan nations, 2-3% church-attending, Bible-believing Christians in the whole continent of Europe, France, Spain, Germany, Holland. They are all went from Christian evangelizing nations to the point where there's essentially no Christians there. Jesus said, in, in, you know, in the verse that's the most memorized, most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. Just back up four verses, and you had Nicodemus coming to see Jesus in the middle of the night looking for answers in life. I think he was asking those kind of questions. You know, what is truth? What's life all about? What's really important in life? And among, in the midst of asking these kind of questions, Jesus looked Nicodemus right in the eye. This was the wisest, most revered teacher in Israel. This was the man that people came to for answers. And he went to see Jesus at night because he really didn't know who Jesus was at that point. And Jesus looks him in the eye and he says, Nicodemus, if you don't believe me when I tell you of earthly things, how are you going to believe me when I tell you of spiritual things? You see, it's an if-then statement. If you reject the earthly stuff, how are you going to believe the spiritual stuff? See, there's the disconnect. Spiritual, earthly, you can't disconnect them. The second if-then statement. Jesus made this statement also. Jesus said, if you do not believe Moses and the prophets, neither will you be persuaded though one rise from the dead. And you see, that's what's going on. What Moses, in the first five books, the Pentateuch of the Bible, talked about were earthly things. Where did everything come from? Why does it look the way it is? Why does the world operate the way it does? If that's all rejected, if it doesn't mean what it says, then neither will you be persuaded the one rise from the dead. And Jesus is becoming more and more irrelevant in our culture. And lastly, another if-then statement. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the foundations of every Christian doctrine are found back there in Genesis. Why do we wear clothes? Because of the sinful nature of man. You know, where, where did sin and death come from? All of the basic foundations are right back in Genesis. So how did we get to this point where there's a separation of the physical from the spiritual? Well, what's been going on for the last hundred years, starting in Europe and moving across the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean into the America, and really accelerating from the 1960s on, is an educational system where we, as Christians, have allowed our children and our, those around us to be run through a system where they hear absolutely nothing about any of the basic biblical statements of where we came from, why the world looks the way it does, the connection of biology, geology, physics with the Bible. It's all ignored as if the Bible really doesn't say what it says, and we're trying to find some explanation for things that leave the Bible out. Meanwhile, the church is fighting the social issues. We're, we're, we're worried about euthanasia and abortion and homosexual behavior, and they're all symptoms. Underlying those symptoms are the philosophical mindset of where we came from. Uh, Christianity is built on a basis of creation, which ties reality of where we came from, the physical world, to the moral, spiritual concepts. The worldview that supports all of these symptoms basically tries to explain everything without God, and coming out of that explanation that leaves God out are all of the symptoms. It's like going to a doctor with lots of problems you have cancer, it's eating away at your insides, you walk into the doctor's office, you tell him your symptoms, he runs some tests, and he discovers that you have cancer. But he says, I, I found out you have cancer, but I'm not going to treat the cancer, I'm, but you've got all these nasty symptoms, we're going to concentrate all of our effort on treating the symptoms. You would immediately go to another doctor. The doctor's a fool. He's acting as if the cause isn't there. 
And that's what's been going on in the Christian church. They give lip service to Genesis and creation, and they say they believe it, but then they never connect it to the physical world and, and what that implications are with the physical world. So this is how everybody around you is being trained is reality. Now, you've heard this, but I've got to repeat it to lay the groundwork. Reality, according to the world around us, according to the museums, according to the newspapers, according to the magazines, according to the textbooks, according to the table television shows, says that there's a Big Bang about 15 billion years ago. That was a fact, and that's what brought everything about. And in the order of 5 billion years ago, the Earth forms. And in the order of 3 billion years ago, chemicals came alive. And about a billion years ago, though, these simple forms of life diversified and started to crawl out on the land and become all the other forms of life we see. And about a million years ago, mankind appeared. And this is taught as a fact. It's not taught as a theory. It's accepted as a fact by the scientific community. And it's taught as a fact in the textbooks. And by most people, the majority of our country, they think some or all of that's a fact. And you see how closely tied the huge time periods are with the evolutionary model. The model has to have huge periods of time. Well, there are implications, enormous implications of that to Christianity. And for the most part, the Christian church, starting in the mid-1800s, looked at what the scientists had to say. Hey, there's a huge layer of rock. That must have taken a huge period of time. Large periods of time were there. So the Bible can't mean what it says. We've got to reinterpret it to fit the facts of science. Well, the implication, if there have been millions and billions of years and life has developed in some way and you want to twist the Bible to fit it into that time frame, then there has to have been suffering and death and disease and extinctions. You've got to explain all those bones. You've got to explain all those things in the rock layers somehow if there's been huge periods of time, then that's the explanation. That means God must have been responsible for all that. He must have made things that way in order to develop us. Um, in, in the, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible is just real straightforward. Read it like you would any other book. It talks about the rapid formation of the entire universe fully formed and functional approximately 6,000 years ago. I mean, I'm going to go into detail in a moment where that comes from. It talks about the sudden appearance of every basic form or kind of different life forms. It talks about the degeneration of life as a direct consequence of man's sin. And it talks about a mountain-covering flood, global in extent, and it's very clear what the language means, global in extent, that destroyed and buried almost all life approximately 5,000 years ago. Ballpark figure. So there's the two models. Very, very different. And when people try to get them to agree, guess which one gets modified? Sadly, it's God's word that gets modified and, and marked out and disagreed and reinterpreted and analogized. And this is where I get into the main part of this lecture. If you really understand what science does, you find out that's totally unnecessary. And all you're really doing is discrediting the record God gave us about where we came from. And I want to mention one more thing before I go on. I've probably heard this a hundred times if I've heard it once. And from pastors, from other people, their explanation of how to somehow justify that when God talks about in six days, I made the heavens and the earth and all that's in them and rested on the seventh. Therefore, you do go and do likewise. They jump over to Second Peter and they pull out a verse that says, yeah, but a day is like a thousand years. But read the verse. Second Peter says, but beloved, do not be ignorant of one thing. One day with the Lord, with the Lord, is as a thousand years. But don't stop there. The verse says, and a thousand years is as one day. You see, there's no definition of a day being a thousand years there. It's just a timelessness of God's statement. It has nothing to do with a day not being a day. It, you're totally taking scripture out of context when you try to do those sort of twisted things. What does the Bible say about the age of the earth? This is the first statement that is basically ignored by those who want to believe 
There have been millions and billions of years, and the Bible supports that concept. Um, in Genesis 1.31, you're reading through the narrative that I believe God gave to Adam, and Adam passed on and ended up in the hands of Moses, and he wrote it down, and it, eventually we have it in our hands. Um, scripture says, And God saw that everything he made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. And by the way, every time a number is used with the word day in Scripture, it means a literal day. There, there are no exceptions. Day can mean the day of Abraham Lincoln, but when you say, this happened six days ago, it means six literal days, and it's the same in Scripture. But God said it was very good. Well, if that doesn't mean that, then, and, and God really used huge periods of time and some sort of an evolutionary process to bring us about, then in essence, mankind is sitting on a huge fossil graveyard as one type of animal slowly turned into another, slowly turned into another, slowly turned into another, and eventually ended with people. And it was diseases and mutations and death and dead ends that eventually led to us. And that makes absolutely no sense that God would call that process very good. So you've got to throw this scripture out because it doesn't mean what it says. This is the biggest problem, that those who want to believe there have been millions and billions of years before creation, or, or led to creation, don't deal with. They simply ignore it. And it's the longest of the Ten Commandments. God took time to explain this commandment. The other ones he just gave us. He said, do it this way. But this one he took time to explain why we're to do it this way. And at the end of, of this commandment, God said, In six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh. Now, that can only mean a day. And if that doesn't mean what it says, why should we obey the commandment? And if that commandment doesn't mean what it says, why should we obey any of the commandments? You see, once you start doing that, you start separating philosophical concepts from the reality of the physical world. And you come, become schizophrenic in your faith, and if after a generation or two generations, faith becomes irrelevant, and Christianity becomes irrelevant. See, that's the cancer that's eating away out of our society. We've picked and choosed and allowed those around us to not believe the clear statements of Scripture because we haven't shared the kind of concepts and the kind of facts that I'm about to show you here tonight. And lastly, the, the words of Jesus himself, people were asking about marriage, he answered, and he said unto them, Have you not read, He that made them at the beginning made them male and female? See, Jesus said, Male and female were made at the beginning. At the beginning of what? He obviously meant at the beginning of creation. And you go back to that doctrine again. You see, a big battle in our culture is this whole homosexual marriage. Is it right? Is it wrong? Should we allow it? We're being awful intolerant. How dare we say what people can and can't do in their bedrooms? Well, if we are arguing from a basis of what the Bible says, the Bible is just another book of opinions in our culture, and it just becomes another talk show debate. There's no basis in reality. But if a man and a woman were really, in reality, made as two separate entities meant to fulfill each other, and it really did happen in time and space and not that long ago, now you've tied a philosophical debate to a real event that really did happen. See, that debate needs to happen on the creation level. And then the whole issue of homosexuality disappears. It's a perversion of design. But the Christian church, instead, it's arguing it on the level of what the Bible says, your opinion versus my opinion, and we're made to look intolerant. And we're going to lose because we're not fighting it on the right level. The basic doctrine goes back to whether you believe the Bible from the very beginning. And so, how, what does the Bible really say about the age of the earth? Once again, it's straightforward. Scripture is just straightforward in how it states things. Um, it, in the book, of, this is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God he made them, male and female he made them, God repeats things because it's important and because it's going to be messed up someday. We're going to get it wrong. Because of that, he emphasizes things over and over in Scripture. Here, once again, he made them male and female. And then Adam lived 130 years and begot a son, and Seth lived so long and begot a son, and so on. And you just go right down through the list, you find out by the time you get to Abraham, about 2,000 years have passed, 
There was about 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus, about 2,000 years from Jesus to us. You come up with the range of approximately 6,000 years. Now, there's some debate and some argument, and and I don't get into the real nitty-picky details, but the book, just taken at face value to mean what it says, and God doesn't try to make things complicated and hide things from us, would indicate that the earth is about 6,000 years old. That is an absolutely incredible concept in this day and age. People shut down when they hear someone say something like that. Why? Let me back up again, though, and repeat. This is just in a straightforward way what the Bible has to say. There was a creation. There was the fall of mankind. As we sinned, spit in God's face, said, we don't want to obey your rules. We want to make the rules. God changed the entire creation at that point. It started its downward spiral. That's where death came from. That's where mutation started. That's where the problems and diseases started. Because of our actions, not because God chose to just use that kind of method to make us. Then there was the flood. That's what explained, as we heard just a little bit ago, this huge fossil record around the world. And then you get to the various dialogues of the Bible. But it lays out those basic, huge interventions of God first. Then it gets starts to fine-tune in on God's solution to why the world's the way it is. This is a statement by someone who, a theologian, who doesn't want to believe what the Bible has to say. But he says, it is apparent that the most straightforward understanding of the Genesis record without regard to all of the other considerations suggested by science is that God created the heaven and earth in six solar days. In other words, that is what the Bible says. And anybody who really treats the text of the Bible fairly has to come to that conclusion. Well, what does science say about the age of the earth? Well, science can't prove how old anything is. It can't. It it, it merely makes some assumptions and tries to figure it out. And And this is how all dating methods work. If you go away with nothing but this tonight, this will really clear a lot of clouds in your mind. You you see, essentially, every dating method uses the equation at the top. It it, it says that uh, time, some amount of time that's passed, is equal to some amount that you started with divided by the rate, or some amount you presently have. Now, let me explain it this way. Suppose Peter is sitting under the tree early one morning, it's 6 a.m. in the morning, because he likes to go out, read his Bible, pray, and just meditate on the word early in the morning before his day gets started. And as Peter is sitting there under the tree, he happens to see George, a friend he knows from a nearby town, come walking along. Well, Peter's been in high school, and he has just went through his physics class, and he knows how dating methods work. And he thinks, well, this is interesting. Peter lives in a t- or George lives in a town 21 miles away. That's, whoops, let me back that back up. Okay. 21 miles away, that's the amount. And he's walking along, and most people walk along at about 3 miles an hour. That's the rate. So 21 miles divided by 3 miles an hour means that he has been on the road 7 hours. That's the time. See, he's just done a dating method. How long has he been on the road? How long ago did he leave? 7 hours ago. Except it's 6 in the morning. Why would George have gotten up at 11 o'clock and walked all night to get to that point. In order to get the right time, you have to have the correct measured amount, you have to have the right initial amount, and you have to make sure there was never any contamination. In other words, suppose George's car just broke down right around the corner, which is only three miles away, and he's only been on the road for three miles. He's only left one hour ago you are off by almost an order of magnitude because you didn't get the measured amount right or the initial amount right. Or suppose there's a shortcut you didn't know about that cuts it to six miles. You get a totally wrong amount because there was a contamination of the rate, of of the route. Uh, It wasn't the right route. Or suppose he took up jogging or marathon running since you've known him last, so he was really traveling at 10 miles an hour instead of 3 miles an hour. So he's only been on the road for two hours. You see, you get the totally wrong answer unless you know everything. Okay. All right. Let me um, 
Now, keep that in mind. I'm going to switch to something just to kind of set in your minds what's going on in our society and what we're up against. Remember, science cannot prove how old something is. It's based on assumptions. And yet, this, is, this in our culture, I'm going to show you a, a short video clip. Okay, this is a contrast between... Evolution is a fact, not a theory. It really happens. We wish to pursue the truth no matter where it leads. But to find the truth, we need imagination and skepticism both. We will not be afraid to speculate, but we will be careful to distinguish speculation from fact. The Big Bang is at upper left in the first second of January 1st. Fifteen billion years later is our present time, the last second of December 31st. These guys, for example, the trilobites, appeared 600 million years ago. They were around for 300 million years. They're all gone. There's none left. But in those old rocks, there are no fossils of people or cattle. We've evolved only recently. A DNA strand like me is a blueprint for building a living thing. And sometimes animals that went extinct millions of years ago, like dinosaurs, left their blueprints behind for us to find. We just had to know where to look. A hundred million years ago. Okay. We're just not having a lot of luck tonight. Or uh, meeting some opposition. Right, i got to restart things. I apologize. As this film clip goes along, and it, it runs about six minutes, um, it goes through, and, and you've seen this, it goes through Star Trek and Jurassic Park and, and National Geographic specials and uh, Discover specials and um, the, the 2000 biology textbook that uh, my kids are using where page after page after page after page, dozens and dozens of times it talks about this appeared 200 million years ago. This appeared a billion years ago. This appeared, uh, you, you know, 50 million years ago. Dinosaurs um, disappeared 65 million years ago. It's always presented as fact. Um, and, and almost all of those are based on radiometric dating methods. Okay, I'm going to start over again right here. We've lost so much time, I'm going to skip past the video clips. Um, the fact is, and this is a fact, the vast majority of dating methods indicate a relatively young Earth. And many, many dating methods indicate the Earth's only 6,000 years old. Um, this is a quote by uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys. He's a, uh, just retired recently from a PhD from Los Alamos Laboratories. Um, he's been studying the age of the Earth all his life. Uh, he has discovered that for every dating method to indicate there have been billions of years of Earth history, there are 10 methods that indicate the Earth is far too young for evolution to have ever happened. Um, and, and as you go and speak on dating methods, you, you can just present dozens of methods that indicate a young Earth. But remember what I just said, science can't prove the age of things because it all depends on assumptions. You see, the only way to ever absolutely for sure know how long ago something happened that was beyond historic times is for someone who was there and saw it happen and who would never lie to you to tell you when and how it happened. That's, there is no scientific way. That's the only way. And that's what this is. This is a document given to man by someone who was there to see things formed and who would never lie to us, tell us when and how everything happened. But I'm going to go through a few of these because it is very useful to realize the majority of the data agrees with what God has given us. You see, Christianity is not a blind faith. Christianity ties the physical world, the earthly things, to philosophical spiritual concepts. That's what makes Christianity so strong. And that's why the church is losing our culture. It's because they quit doing that. They decided to relegate the physical, scientific stuff to the world and concentrate on the spiritual stuff. And until we stop doing that, 
until we as Christians share with others and as church leaders and as potential pastors realize how important this issue is, we will continue to lose our culture. Well, so what does science say about the age of the earth? Radiometric dating methods supposedly prove that the earth is billions of years old. Well, I'm going to start with that because it, it's the biggest hole. I, I just about a year ago taught a four-week class at a, uh, a, a state college. It was a senior citizens in the evening uh, at, at Saginaw State University in Michigan. Went through all the biology evidence, went through all the geology evidence, went through the anthropology and the ape man, and spent time talking about dating methods. And at the end, there was a high school science teacher who raised his hand after I was all done, had heard an enormous amount of evidence, and he said, yeah, but how do you explain that every single short-life radioactive element is totally decayed, totally gone, things that would take tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of years to decay, and yet many of these elements are totally decayed already? How can that be if there haven't been millions of years past? And to be honest, I didn't have a good answer for him. But about three months later, I attended the, um, the, the, the creation conference. The um, International Conference for Creationism happens every four years. And Dr. Russ Humphreys and others who have been studying this issue discovered something that I never knew and ties into my specialty at Dow Chemical. And it has to do with helium. You see, helium results from most radioactive decay processes. When uranium and some other radioactive elements decay, they give off a burst of energy and they also spit out a helium nuclei, which grabs an electron and turns into a helium atom. Whoops, let's move forward again. Okay. And since this decay happens in solid rock, the helium gets trapped inside of that solid rock. The time that it takes for that helium to permeate out of the rock and disappear into the air is a very, very dependable measurement of how long ago that decay happened. The older the rock is, the less helium should be present. Let me just demonstrate that. Suppose, and look, here. So where that helium is, if it's still in the rock or is it out of the rock, tells the true age of the rock. Well, one of the places you find these are in little crystals called zircon crystals. Granite is chucked full of these zircon crystals. And inside of these zircon crystals, magnified thousands and thousands of time, you find these little radio discolorations that happen when the radioactive decay happened. Um, it, the, the high energy decayed the crystal, so you know, you can actually count those and know how much uranium, or you can do an assay of the rock and find out how much radioactive element was there. From that, you can figure out exactly how much helium had to have been formed inside that rock. And it had to have formed when the rock was hard and cooled, or else those discolorations wouldn't have been there. So if this is a zircon crystal, Okay, and right after the granite forms and cools, um, the, the radioactive decay happens. Bang, let's say that's, that's the uranium. It's just decayed. So now, inside of that zircon crystal is locked a bunch of helium. The discolored water is representative of the helium. Well, suppose that every 100 years, helium is a very energetic little molecule. It bounces around some of that helium disappears in another hundred years. Some of the helium disappears in another hundred years. Some of the helium works its way out of the rock in another hundred years. Some of the helium works its way out of the rock. Well, you don't know when that decay happened, but you can measure all of the, the radioactive elements that used to be in the rock. So if you measure that every hundred years, because you know how fast it permeates out, we can also measure that. You find out that a fourth of it is gone, and if, you know, each scoop took 100 years, then you know that it's 400 years ago that decay happened. You see, helium, you know, in a balloon like this, you've all seen these kind of balloons, it will stay for a long time. You put it in a rubber balloon, and it would disappear very, very rapidly. These balloons were, I started out with a balloon like that, it was filled up at the same time. Within a day, the helium had all permeated through the skin and was gone. This one will take weeks, but it will still happen. The helium will permeate out. Well, in a rock, it's not a matter of days or weeks. It's a matter of hundreds of years. 
but it still happens. Well, no one had ever measured this before until Russ Humphreys and his team decided, let's just see what is the permeation rate. What he found out, he measured the permeation rate from these zircon crystals. He measured it at different levels so he could account for temperature. And he found out that approximately half of the original helium is still in the rock. And that indicated, based on the permeation rate that he measured very accurately scientifically, that that radioactive decay had to have happened in the last 6,000 years. He dated granite around the world at about 6,000 years. There is absolutely no way that helium should still be there unless that radioactive decay, there was a burst of radioactive decay either during the creation period or the flood period or both that locked that helium in that rock because it should be long gone. If it was 100,000 years old, there'd be no helium left in the rocks. If it was a million years old, there'd be absolutely no helium left in the rocks because it comes out of those crystals so fast. And yet it's still there. You see there's a lack of helium in the atmosphere. We measure the total amount of helium in the atmosphere. We measure all the helium that's coming in from all known sources. We find out the maximum age of our atmosphere is about 10,000 years. If we look at the amount of helium left in these crystals, we come to the conclusion, and how fast it moves out of those crystals, we find out that they can only be about 6,000 years old. And it's, it's, I, I know of no explanation other than the fact that those rocks formed quite recently that could put it all there and have it still be there. And there's, so that's kind of a complicated technical discovery, but it's, it's, it's an almost ironclad indication that the Earth is quite young. And, and you won't find this in your textbooks because it doesn't allow for evolution. Humans are always portrayed as, as ignorant, stupid idiots as they're older. By the way, all cultures, all cultural studies, from the Egyptians to the Incas, wherever there were human beings in the past, they were incredibly intelligent and inventive. So uh, I, I, it, it is funny to see them made fun of, but it doesn't match reality. Now, there's a bunch of dating methods that have to do with, you know, where is everybody? Um, suppose early humans were supposed to have emerged about four million years ago. Let's assume that they only lived for 25 years back then. Let's assume there's a stable population of only 100,000. You know, there's about 100,000 or so elephants in Africa and they're on the endangered species list. Humans are a lot smarter, so that quite likely, even as they, if, if we evolved and they were emerging from trees, there would have been far more of them. But even with these generous assumptions, if we emerged four million years ago, only lived 25 years each, there's never been more than 100,000 people on the planet, there should have been six trillion human beings from apes turning into human beings that lived. We found a few false skull fragments. There's almost nothing out there. Where are all the bodies? You see, it fits what the Bible has to say. You can trust scripture. But it doesn't fit what the textbooks and the museums and all the nonsense we hear around us has to say. Where are all the graves? Every ancient people bury their dead. They bury them with valuable artifacts and, artifacts and spears and all sorts of things that they had in life because all people at all times in all ages know there is something after this life. It's been built into us. Well, let's assume that all of these people that used to live had a longer lifespan. So you had 50 of them. And let's say that there were a million people planet-wide for the last 30,000 years. So supposedly Neanderthal man was around 30,000 years ago. You see that date all the time. And there's only been a million people on the whole planet. And every one of these people lived 50 years. If you do the simple math, you find out there should have been 600 million graves in that period of time. 600 million. We found a few hundred. Where are all the graves? Where are all the bodies? Where are all the graves? And where are all the people? You see, as far back as we go in population studies, we find that historically, clear back to the time of Christ and beyond, where censuses were gone and you can estimate population based on, on anthropology and studies, that the world population seems to have doubled every 150 years. 
And this is despite wars that wiped out massive numbers of people, famine and disease. The world population continues to double about every 150 years. Well, if you start with six people coming off the ark, Noah and his wife would have had no more children, so you have six people, you know, three sons with three daughters, and you double them. It took them 150 years to be up to 12 people, which is very generous. You double it again, you double it again, you double it again, you'd find out you would have had to double it 30 times to reach the present world population. Only 30 times. 30 times 150 years for each doubling means that would take about 4,500 years of world history. That's about the time the Bible tells us Noah's flood happened and the people from the ark spread out across the world. You can trust the Bible. You see, when you do the science, you compare it with the world around us, every time you find out you can trust the Bible. It's only when you start out with faulty assumptions you come up with faulty answers. I'm going to whip through a few of these fast. The Earth's magnetic field has shown a systematic decrease. In the last 150 years, it's decreased 15%. This has never been explained by natural scientific evidence. All sorts of speculation, all sorts of stories told about it, as we said. But the fact is, our magnetic field is significantly decreasing. If you work that backwards, you find out it would have been impossibly strong 10,000 years ago. It sets the age of the Earth under 10,000 years. It's a very strong evidence. It's never been refuted. And there's this, these rapid reversals that are apparent in the rock records. That can be explained by a creation model, too, and some wonderful papers have been written on it. Can't be explained by evolutionary assumptions. Um, every culture in the world, this was mentioned earlier, every culture has an acknowledgement that there's been a worldwide flood. And, and there, here you get into the real crux of the matter. You see, the Bible talks about a worldwide flood in Genesis extensively and for a large period I mean, it doesn't spend as much time talking about creation of everything as it does about this worldwide flood. Then it talks about it in Psalms. It talks about it in Proverbs. It talks about it in Job. It, Jesus Christ mentioned it. Um, he tied the condi moral condition of the world to the moral condition before the first judgment. And he specifically said the flood came and took them all away. But this is the one that gets me. In first, Second Peter, I'm sorry, Peter makes a statement that scoffers will come in the last days saying, all things have considered since they have from the beginning of creation. And they will willfully forget that by the word of God, the earth was made out of water and that the world that then existed perished being flooded by water. Think of the implications. Remember all those cultures I just showed you? Every culture in the world has an, had an acknowledgement of a flood for about... 5,000 years plus of earth history, there was a universal acknowledgement that there was a worldwide flood. It's only been in the last 150 years that the scientific community, and, it, and it's really just the majority, not all of the scientific community, based on faulty assumptions, has denied that there's been a flood. 5,000 years, universal acknowledgement, 150 years of denial Guess what days we're in, according to the Bible? It's a clear indicator. God is getting ready to wrap things up. See, the flood is that bottom line issue. If you really want to know how old the earth is, you can't deny some major event that happened in earth history. Um, huge layers of geology would have been laid down incredibly rapidly by water washing over the whole surface of the earth. Forests of trees would have been washed up and washed together and buried in sediment that would have turned to coal seams. And when huge flood-like events happen, you don't get just a mixture, a mismosh of, of everything all blended together. Uh, when Mount St. Helens exploded in 1980, an enormous mud flow flowed down the mountain and you've got fine layers, just fine little layers during this catastrophic flow event that was flowing down the mountain. This whole river valley formed in one day as water that was backed up behind a dam broke through the sediment and carved out this valley. See, that's the kind of thing that was happening during the worldwide flood. And our universe is full of what I call smoking guitars. I'm sorry, smoking cigars. <laughs> <laughs> if you walked into a room and that balloon was on the ceiling, 
and the geology professor was standing at the door to let you into the room, and he said, there has been no one in this room for 10,000 years. Now come on in. You walk in the room and you see this helium balloon sitting on the ceiling. It's obvious evidence that you haven't been told the truth because the helium would have permeated out, just like the helium in those zircon crystals should have long ago permeated out. It shouldn't be there if they're as old as we're told. And the, the, the whole universe is full of these. Spiral galaxies shouldn't still be spiraled up. The, the moon should have receded further from the Earth than it is. You know, comets should not still be in existence because they lose the material every time they come around the sun. You know, Saturn's rings and Jupiter's moon Io should not still be hot and they should not still be in the patterns that they're in. Unless they're not as old as we're told. All around us we see indicators that things are not as old as we're being led to believe. The most prolific dating method that you hear about constantly is radiocarbon dating. And this is the last one I'll talk about. See, radiocarbon forms as cosmic rays, high energy rays come into the atmosphere and, and they, they hit, hit a nitrogen molecule, blow it apart. Um, some of the particles from the nitrogen particles combine, recombine to form a carbon-14 particle, which combines with oxygen to form radioactive CO2, which the plants take in, and they get radioactive CO carbon in them, and the animals eat the plants, and they get radioactive carbon, and the radioactive carbon gets uniformly spread throughout everything that's alive. And as long as you're alive and you're eating anything, you're taking in radioactive carbon in the same proportion that's in the atmosphere. Well, the thing about radioactive carbon is that we've measured it very accurately, and every 5,720 years, if you stop eating, in 5,720 years, all the cells and all the carbon parts of your body, half of that radioactive carbon will have decayed. So if you measure how much radioactive carbon is left in your body 5,000 years from now, or some unknown, and you have half as much as you have today, you would, you would come to the conclusion that it was 5,730 years since you died. It, it, it really makes sense. It's a good dating method. But it makes a huge assumption. Well, I'm going to go back. It assumes that there's always been the same amount of biomatter in the world. You see, God described the world as a paradise before the flood. Huge amounts of water had to have been trapped underneath the earth before the flood. It said the fountains of the great deep broke up. There could easily have been 10 or 100 times as much vegetation. There, there's no ice caps, um, no deserts, lots more vegetation. If the same amount of radioactive carbon was forming before the flood, and there was 10 times as much vegetation, then the concentration of radioactive carbon in everything that's alive would have been 10 times less. So if you dated it right after the flood, you would think that a whole bunch of it had disappeared if you made the wrong assumptions. You see, all radiocarbon dating does is assume that there's never been a worldwide flood, and therefore they come up with huge long ages. Um, there's more, st I don't have time to go into more detail, but that's the basis, the basic reason why it gives you such a wrong age. It assumes there's never been a flood. Wrong assumptions, wrong answer. But the bigger problem, you know, I'm going to just go through this. The bigger problem is that radiocarbon does disappear. You see, that radioactive carbon, in 5,000 years you have a fourth of it. 10,000 years, there's an eighth of it. 15,000 years later, there's a sixteenth of the original amount. 20,000 years later, there's a 32nd of the original amount. You know, 25,000 years ago, there's a 64th of the original amount. The fact is, every single atom of radioactive carbon should be gone within 250,000 years. There shouldn't be an atom of it left. If something that used to be alive 250,000 years ago died, by today, if that amount of time had passed, there should be no radioactive carbon left. It should be gone, zero, zip. Modern equipment can measure levels down to 0.001% of, of the modern amount that's in things that are alive today. There's only one part, and I believe this is correct, per trillion radioactive carbon 
for every normal carbon atom, and yet we can measure 0.001%. This, this is absolutely astounding fact of science that's just ignored. Every single molecule on this planet of organic origin contains 0.1 to 0.5% of the modern level of radioactive carbon. Dinosaur bones have 0.3 parts of radioactive carbon. Coal seams from every level in every area of the world have 0.1 to 0.5 percent of modern radioactive carbon. Fossilized wood, shells, graphite, even things that were never alive have radioactive carbon in them. It shouldn't be there. You know what this is called by the, the scientific community? It's called background levels of radioactive carbon. They went through an extensive program, a 10-year program, to purify with every possible way they could to get rid of this background, what they're calling background level, of radioactive carbon, and they totally failed. It's always there, no matter how they try to purify it or eliminate contamination. This is absolutely astounding evidence for a young Earth. The reason it's there is because all this stuff isn't that old. Abraham Lincoln made this statement. The Bible contains an immense amount of evidence as to its authenticity. Let us treat the Bible fairly. If we had a witness on the stand whose general story was true, we would believe him even when he asserted the facts of which we had no other evidence. In other words, we can't, in spite of all everything I just showed you, we can't prove that the earth is 6,000, 10,000, 5,000, 20,000 years old. But the vast majority of the evidence indicates it is quite young. Nevertheless, we ought to treat the Bible with equal fairness, even if we can't prove it with evidence. I decided long ago it was less difficult to believe that the Bible was what it claimed to be than to disbelieve it. The three if-then statements, we are losing our culture because we're disconnecting the physical things from the heavenly things. We're denying what the Bible has to say at the beginning so people aren't believing what it has to say at the end. And we've allowed the foundations of Scripture to be destroyed and the righteous are finding themselves ineffective in our culture. And at the heart of this, at the bullseye of this whole problem, is this idea of billions of years versus what the Bible clearly has to say. You see, the Bible says God made everything in six days, and it says he did it quite recently. Millions of years means God didn't do it that quick. Millions of years mean God used a method of death and suffering and killing and distinction and pain in order to bring us about. So when someone dies, when something really horrible happens, guess what the non-Christian, their natural response is? Well, this is the way things have always been. God must be responsible for it. And there's anger. And there's a rejection of who God is. The atheists and the agnostics clearly understand this. This is a statement by Carl Sagan. If God is omnipotent and omnipotent, why didn't he start the universe out in the first place so it had come out the way he wants? Why is he constantly repairing and complaining? No, there's one thing the Bible makes clear. The biblical God is a sloppy manufacturer. He's not good at design. He's not good at execution. He'd be out of business if there was any competition. That's because he assumes there's never been a fall. He assumes when the Bible talks about biology, when the Bible talks about geology and the worldwide flood, it's wrong. Therefore, this statement is true. But if there was a flood, there was a creation, and there was a fall, then that, that's why we can explain everything. You see, there was a creation, there was a corruption of creation, there was a catastrophe, and there was confusion, and then God sent Christ in the cross. And those are reality. And until we start emphasizing that those were reality, we'll continue to use, lose our culture. But if you look at death from a biblical history, you realize that death entered because of our sin, because of the fall, and God has given us a solution to that. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ becomes extremely relevant in people's lives. You see, we've got to start fighting the battle at the creation level. And that's why I love to do this talk, because it, it really rattles people's perception of what is reality. When they see the whole world believing in huge time periods, 
and they realize that's all based on faulty assumptions, it brings them back to the reality of Scripture. I'm going to end, and I went just a little bit over, I apologize. My, my, a big part of my goal tonight was to educate, but the other part was to motivate, because this is the core. I mean, I mean, you all, by coming to this meeting, are the core of who's going to change our culture that we are losing. But, but you've got to have tools to do it. There's lots of good creation stuff out there. Julie mentioned these books, and, and it's just, this is what God's put on my heart. You know, this is a devotional. 365 days, 365 different little evidences that we can trust God's word from every different area of science. We've got evolution out there and this billions and millions of years idea that just seems like a huge giant that we couldn't possibly tie down or control. But if we go at it just a step at a time, by the time you work through evidences in geology and evidence from physics and evidences from biology and biochemistry and dating methods and where did language come from and how does history fit into it all, and you give someone who doesn't understand Christianity a book like this, by the time they get to the end, they realize how deceived they've been all their lives. And it's just in little short sound bites. We live in a sound bite society. And that's why a book like this is such an important gift. You know, it's a devotional that, you know, get it into people's hands. Um, you know, search for the truth. These were newspaper articles that were put in a public newspaper. Caused a firestorm of awareness. Letters to the editor written back and forth. I, you know, the Lord's blessed me to be able to publish all these books. It's not just this one, but all of them come totally copyright granted for you to use in any possible way. I have people making copies, handing them out in a hospital, orderlies as they move people from room to room, giving them pieces of information so they can understand the Bible from the foundation up. Um, put these things to use. They're going to make a difference in our culture. Um, and the, the last one I'm going to mention... Um, this one deals with the millions of years issue. It's called a wake-up call to America's churches. Our churches have forgotten to connect the physical with the spiritual. And when we get them back to this, we'll start to see people coming to Christ. Folks who have read all three of these books, I've given their life to the Lord after reading them. Um, so that's where I'm going to end. You can trust God's word. In the most controversial, in the eyes of most people, ridiculous issue that this earth could be 6,000 years old is perfectly lines up with the scientific evidence if you make the right assumptions. The resources are here to put to use and make a difference to your friends and to our culture. And I just challenge you to do so.